Welcome back to the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. I'm Michael Colligan. That's Greg Garrick. We've been told we have to say our names more because we have new people coming to the show all the time. And they listen to three or four episodes and they never they never hear my name. On today's show, we have Pete Gret. Pete is the driving force behind the BlackRock Group, a trailblazer in supply chain consulting with a keen eye for innovation. Pete is now steering into the future with BlackRock Software Company where he's embracing the transformative power of artificial intelligence. Under his hashtag Tech Sherpa brand, he's dedicated to guiding businesses through the evolving landscape of technology, ensuring they stay ahead in today's digital ascent. Join Pete as he unpacks the complexities of supply chains here on the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast and explores the frontiers of artificial intelligence. Go to the BlackRock Group. That's the black rock dot group. Before we get into that, Greg, we got to go to etissl.com, a hot new sponsor of the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. Everybody needs to know about this company, buddy. Oh, yeah. They're huge, number one. You know, they have a whole ton of products out there, but one that's unique. And, you know, a lot of people do a lot of the Me Too stuff. ETI has their own thing called the Night Lighter, and it's a nice, warm 2000 Kelvin night light glow Ooh. that they put around their fixtures and it's not any just one fixture it's many it's a three inch can a four inch a six inch an eight inch square cans they have flush mount different sizes available they even have a nice one by four that i just found this out um that is like a flat panel but it has that nice little edging around it perfect for like a multi-housing in their kitchen they all have those cloud lights mm. upgrade them give them a little night light on a 2000k i might even get one what do you think I think I need one for my front hallway of my house, buddy, with a little night light on, nice warm, low Kelvin temperature, dark sky yeah. friendly in the house, not going to affect the circadian rhythm. Go to etissl.com. The scope of what they have is enormous. Check them out, especially, uh, you know, a, a, a recently joined Nailed member as well. So while you're checking right. those people out, open another tab. That's right. And if you have light bulbs in a warehouse, got light bulbs in a warehouse, you sell them to the people out on the street, you sell them on the internet, you sell them online, you sell them over the phone, on the order desk, all that sort of stuff. Why are you not a member of the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors? Your, your crucial shield against all the weapons against the lighting industry that we're trying to defeat. We've got to get these suckers out of the industry. All these non-player characters, we call them. That's right. You can help us out by joining Nail. That's right. Join to serve. We've got no ROI for you. Get out of here. Your dues are 400 bucks a year, 900 bucks a year, something like that. You know, get an ROI. You get to serve the industry. Go to naald.org. Welcome to the show, Pete Gret. Thanks for having me, guys. No problem. So, Pete, this is a question that, you know, don't take offense to it, but why do we have you on here? What are you, what are you <laughs> going to tell us thing. about your lighting? <laughs> supply chain. Well, two things, right? One, everybody has a supply chain. And we saw with COVID and everything that happened after that, that it can be disrupted really easily, either because you got a pandemic or you got a boat stuck in the Suez, or you got a bridge that collapsed in Baltimore. Everybody's got a supply chain. And if they're not monitoring, they're not paying attention to it with some intentionality, they're going to find it out one day when something like, unfortunately, the Baltimore bridge collapse happens. And now they're going to be in, in a world of hurt in a lot of different ways. So that's number one. Number two is everybody wants to have AI these days. And that includes individuals, companies, divisions, just everybody wants AI. And we are leaning heavily into integrating that in all sorts of software platforms. So I love a good supply chain collapse. I think that's great. I mean, there's nothing better than someone comes and says, I can't find this light bulb. Come into my web, said the spider to the fly. Um, yeah, so, you know, there's just so many pieces with that. Yeah, I mean, when, when the supply chain collapsed in lighting, I mean, that was great for a lot of lighting distributors who knew where to get all sorts of different things. So when there's a perceived shortage or a shortage for some people in an industry, it's actually to the benefit of others, is it not, Pete? A absolutely right. We really saw the pandemic as an opportunity to differentiate, differentiate yourself. You know, when times of crisis and there's chaos, that's the time that the well-run machine, the well-run company, they can shine and they can really make a difference in the market and scoop up a lot of market share too. 
Um, we saw this at the pandemic, right? Empty shelves, not good. People who had product, people who didn't just offshore everything. It's not just the supply chain. It's, you know, it's a manufacturing strategy as well, right? What are you going to offshore? What are you going to near shore? What are you going to make at home? How much are you going to keep? What kind of safety stock levels do you have? What kind of transportation are you going to take? We see this in the U.S. all the time with Long Beach. Everything's coming through the port of Long Beach because that's where the mega container ships can go. And then when Long Beach has a strike, which it does about every 12 minutes, then, you know, your container ship's not getting offloaded. Your stuff's not going anywhere. And if you've been carrying a lean amount of inventory, then, well, you're going to have empty shelves. Yeah, the United States is extremely vulnerable, and I don't think they know this. Um, the uh, Americans are not aware about of, of how where or how how their products are made. And the big the giant consumption machine, which is the United States, would have a huge problem. Say if somebody blew up that port, forget about strikes. Um, if somebody blew up the long that port in California, you uh, America would be in huge trouble. Um, let's go into um, AI or what I often call artificial stupidity. Because it can go both ways. Tell me what you can do with AI. Uh, you can do just about everything with AI. But the caveat is, is if you are not utilizing like all the features of Microsoft Excel, then the time to jump into AI is maybe a little bit a ways for you, right? Maybe you should, maybe you should review some of your own things. Because one of the things that we tell people is if a technology company all the time is still the fundamental way to run a business is to have a really well-defined process with good data and well-trained employees that you hold accountable and that you incentivize. If you do that, you're going to be successful in 1800 or in 2800. Mm. It, it won't matter. Mm. But you really need to do that before you go to like a technology accelerator like AI. Because if you've taken that step and now you're going to do AI, well, then you're just going to unlock a whole lot of goodness. And there's just so much you can do. Uh, I have kind of a different viewpoint on this than some of my peers. A lot of other people are spending like $100 million and trying to do the digital transformation with AI thing again and like replace all the humans with robots. And A, I don't think that's ever going to happen. B, I don't think it's a good idea. And C, it's going to take forever and $100 million is just the down payment. I think the real opportunity is to make individual people's lives better, right? So if you can make someone's job 50% more efficient and you could do that in weeks, I think that's a win. Mm. So what is it you guys do at BlackRock exactly? So we do two things primarily, soft, uh, software implementations in the supply chain space. So we help folks run their supply chains with systems. And then the other part of that is now we've pivoted and have a software company where we're building AI products and doing AI work. Like, what does so that like do? Said, like, rename all the pictures on your website or something? <laughs> like, I, I, well, I was just I was just in a meeting where they were talking about naming the pictures on a website, and I was like, oh, okay. And I'm just thinking, like, could you yeah. like wave your magic wand and change all the pictures to have the right name? You could, you could. Um, for me, since I'm focusing on the individual. It's what can I do to automate tasks, remove things that are tedious and take a lot of time. For me, as a owner of a small business, that's like marketing, outreach, lead generation, communications. So all of those kinds of things that I used to spend way, way more time on now, I spend much, much less time on and do about 400% more in output. So that's what that does for me. And I think it's pretty similar for other people. Give me a specific example of that. So like LinkedIn is a great example. So I used AI on LinkedIn to find relevant targets and relevant conversations and then to interject myself into, the, myself into those conversations. So this is what grows a lot of views for me. So by utilizing that kind of technology, in the last two months now, I'm getting a thousand views a day and like 50 more engagements every single day. And that lets me be a part of that conversation so that when we are trying to sell AI products, 
I'm not unfamiliar to everybody in that space. I have a lot more brand awareness. I have a lot more depth of connection with people in that space. That's how he got him to get a grip on lighting podcast. (laughs) That might be it. Yeah. (laughs) That's it right there, man. Yeah. As your work uh, resulted in sales yet, or is this the beginning stage? The AI portion. Yeah. So, so it's some of both. So we have um, our first customer in AI this month. We started on their project and then we've launched another set of service offerings in the AI space and we're looking for, you know, growth from that. But it's really been about six weeks, seven weeks, and we're really trying to grow that, utilize the tools and then turn around and sell them to other people. What is your AI um, name? Because Does your AI have a name? Uh, Tech Sherpa. Tech Sherpa, so, that's what oh, you call them. Tech Sherpa. Is it a man tech or a Sherpa. woman? It's, well, non-binary? it's androgynous, I suppose. <laughs> I suppose it's androgynous. I'll, I'll use a less controversial word. So does it tell you what to do or do you tell it what to do? So I purposely took classes so that I would learn how to interact with it better. Because again, you know, like Excel is a great example. Excel will do a million other things that people basically use it as a calculator. And so I want to make sure and utilize the tool. So I took some free online classes. And one of the, my favorite things to do is have it interrogate me. So frequently it knows what to do, but it needs a lot more information. And the reason people get funny answers is because it doesn't know the information that you have and it tries to kind of fill in the gaps. So you can actually tell it, ask me questions one at a time so I can provide information. And when you have enough information, then do the task that I asked you to do. So it's some of both. It, it really is a conversation. It's, it's collaborative. Yeah, how many? You know how many no, times I've me. told Chat GPT to f off? It's so rude. <laughs> I mean, like it's it just said, like sometimes it's like I'm like get out of here. But well, so, let me ask you this: so you own a software company, you took some online courses, and now you're selling AI to people. I mean, I don't want to be a, I don't want to sound like a jerk here, but that sounds like a little bit quick. It's that easy, it really is. But here's what we've learned with software all over the years: is that even the easiest things people generally won't do. They want someone to do it for them. So it doesn't take a whole lot to understand how all these pieces work and put them together and Mm. then show someone else how to do it or to do it for them. And so most people just want things done for them. I want to replace Greg. He costs too much. Can you replace (laughs) Greg for me? (laughs) Hey, do it. I'm good. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. I I actually think that this is not going to replace people. So at least in the U.S., we have a huge labor shortage. We have a lot of growth that we could do if we had enough labor to actually accomplish the task. And this is going to change just how work's done. So if um, if a lighting company, I don't know if a manufacturer might make more sense or a distributor, you can pick one. Where to go to you? What, what are you going to do for them? What would you, what, is, what does your process look like, and what is the end result yeah. going to look like? So what we're really looking for is what are those tasks that if you had an intern, if you had an admin, you'd be able to give them. How can we reduce that kind of activity in your day? And we go and work with people and it does not take very much time to be able to, so you can train a custom GPT to do specific things for a specific person. And it takes a matter of, you know, maybe an hour and, probably 30 minutes of showing that person how to utilize the tool. And and that's pretty much it. You know, we sit down and have a conversation, generate a new custom GPT, show the person how to use it, and they go to town. It really takes off very quickly. So you were saying earlier that you like to deal with the individual. Like, so a company is going to hire you. There's multiple tasks that happen at a company within each department. What do you do? You go one by one and say, this one, we're going to do this? Generally, you're trying to pick out groups of people that have similar roles, right? So if it's a big enough company where you have, you know, 20 staff accountants or you've got 15 planners or 25 buyers, they're going to have really similar kinds of tasks that they utilize. And that's where you're going to start. And you're going to go where there's the biggest bang for the buck first. And what I mean by focusing on the individual is there's a lot of companies that are like trying to take their huge picture of how they run a company and transform it from the top down and do these really big things like, oh, we're going to have the AI do all of the buying in the whole company. 
it's going to do all of the sourcing in the whole company. And that's a really big problem and a really hard thing to solve. It takes a lot of time and you're going to burn a lot of cash before you get to any output. But if you focus on the individual and said, you know, Fred in accounting spends half of his day reviewing expense reports. Can we get Fred half of his day back by creating a chat GPT that can take care of that for him? That you can have like tomorrow and you have immediate results and you have immediate ROI and it's a really low cost. So when you do something like that, people pay you for the service to get it set up and then what's, where's your ongoing fee? There is no ongoing fee for that particular task. We give it to them yeah. just as a one-time service fee and that's it. We're building a product that we want to try and integrate kind of all of the goodness together of that, that would be an ongoing um, software as a service, but that's not built yet. So right now our AI services are just, we'll do a service for you and then your uh, financial commitment's over. Hmm. And how many of these AI projects have you done that have, have incorporated AI? We're just starting this month with it. So we have the one that we've launched. Got it. So the, uh, what's interesting I find about this is that with technology, people tend to really overestimate the short-term impact of something and really underestimate the long-term impact of something. So over, uh, sorry, overestimate the short-term and, un, and not, I don't know if underestimate the long-term or maybe a better term is not really foresee how the technology will truly be deployed. Like, so when Facebook came out, people thought, this is great. This is great. I get to hang out with all my friends online and they could see all my pictures. And this is so good. They didn't know that Zuckerberg was going to steal all their personal information from them. They didn't know that Zuckerberg was going to hook up with the CIA with his friend Jack Dorsey over at Twitter and all these folks and, you know, spy on Americans. We didn't know how that was going to turn out and it turned out that, you know, that's what happened. And now everybody's, you know, Facebook knows more about you than you do. Um, sure. Where do you foresee this going in the long term? You say you don't see a, a subtraction of people. I disagree with that spectacularly. I think AI is going to... I already f fired the editor of the magazine like six months ago that we had. He's gone because we don't need him anymore. You know, I used to spend weeks writing articles and going back and forth with a professional editor. Now I spend two days sure. doing it with ChatGPT. It takes a couple of days, and I I just get the you know get the contact get the um the flow of the uh of the uh of the article right, get the spelling mistakes yeah. removed, change it to American spelling from Canadian spelling, and all this kind of stuff. So I see it. I, if this works out the way I think it's going to work out, everybody's just going to plug themselves into the matrix. See you later. Well, part of that is always the adoption piece, right? So there's always this grand vision that this is a nice linear adoption path and that, you know, there's no unforeseen pieces that happen and that we can know the future now. And that's never what happens with technology. And it's never what happens with life. So just like we thought Facebook was going to take over the world, you see a declining interest in people and their use of Facebook. Yeah, but they have children. You know, for a like TikTok that, is like Facebook's kid. It, it is, but it's different, right? And if you would have guessed, tried to guess 15 years ago, you wouldn't have guessed that. You wouldn't have mm -hmm. known that. That's what so I'm I saying. From an, AI pers from an AI perspective, it looks like it's going to take over the world, but there's probably going to be a lot of twists and turns along the way. And just historically speaking, every technological advancement has not resulted in less jobs. It's resulted in more and different jobs. So two years ago, there wasn't a job called prompt engineer. Now there's all sorts of prompt engineers. You know, running data centers and training large language models, none of those jobs existed. Now that's a huge portion of a lot of companies. And it's not just technology people that are getting jobs. You know, there are people who are having to do the reinforced learning as human beings where they're teaching the large language models the right ways to think about things and improving their accuracy and reliability. And a lot of that, too, you know, ironically, you mentioned Facebook. Meta has Llama where you can just download it locally. So my biggest concern is more of a privacy concern, too, right? Because if you want to have it like, I don't know, 
look over your accounting books and help you do analysis? Do you really want to send that somewhere? But the other part of that is people use Office 365. They use Google Drive. Those things are already sitting in other people's hands. There's very few companies that today run a fully on-premises server where nothing is in the cloud and nothing goes anywhere and nothing can be touched by anyone else. Greg so just got rid of his been... last week or something, didn't you? <laughs> it's been a few weeks, but yeah, took a while. Yeah, yeah I still you know. I still have a server here, but I I I love I always loved Google Docs from day one. I loved it. I thought yeah. it was a great of an innovation, although it is certainly not private. That is one hundred percent for sure. Absolutely right. So if a person has Google Docs, but they're concerned about putting their data out for a large language model like ChatGPT or Gemini or something, I, I would challenge to say, well, what's the difference? There is no. It's just a, it's just uh, who's in charge of the data changes. That's all. Yeah. And so instead now of uh, really Zuckerberg, you got that Joker at uh, ChatGPT, whatever his name is. I can't remember his name off the top. Yeah. So you know, some of that is if you're really concerned about data, you download Llama and you keep it local. And, you know, the thing that always strikes me as just crazy is when you see, like, the Pentagon's gotten hacked into. It's like, why is that computer even hooked up to the Internet? If you got something that's really important, if you got something that's super secret, don't give remote access to it. Keep it on a server and keep it local somewhere. I can answer that question for you. you can do that with large language models. I can answer that question for you. Because the United States and Canada are largely run by idiots. I'm not kidding well, you. I think... People in general are below average in intelligence. No, most no, of the, the yeah, time. particularly the U.S. government, the Canadian government has a lot of really low IQ, uh, IQ people working in it. You can see. Just watch the news for a bit. Um, do you, uh, Pete, we've had this has been an interesting one. It's a little bit off the topic for lighting. I don't know how it affects light bulbs, Greg Eric, specifically or light fixtures, except maybe maybe it'll get, find its way into the programming of those lighting control systems or something like that down the road. Maybe I don't know. What do you think, Greg? That's what I'm trying to get my head around. Yeah, I mean, he's talking supply chain and, and efficient, making your job more efficient. Um, so from a lighting standpoint, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know that it would do that on the control side. But what do you think, Pete? What, what, what can we look at? Well, you still got a business to run, you know, whether it's a lighting mm -hmm. business or any other kind of business. It's still a business to run. And, yeah. you know, people who are efficient and effective tend to rise to the top. And it's just another tool. That's all it is. And people are going to, if you don't use the tools now that you have correctly, probably not going to use this one correctly either. It'll be amusing to the rest of us because it will spew out nonsense. You'll probably regurgitate it, but you know. That's the artificial stupidity I started talking about from the beginning. Yeah. Um, so like the, so I, my belief, Pete, is that, oh, this guy's getting phone calls. The, the phone's ringing. He's already on and got a grip on lighting and his phone's ringing like crazy. Eh? Hey, geez. So, yeah. no, but the, uh, I think that there, there is to every action. There's an equal opposite reaction, and to you can't have yin without yang. I think that yeah. I think that artificial intelligence will create a st the exact same amount of stupidity as it does intelligence. And I don't think well, here's what it that is. Trap. Well, here's what it is: is as, as one of the people I follow in the space said, don't think of it as artificial. Think of it as augmented. So whatever is you. You're going to get more and faster of you. So if you're a bright person who pays attention to detail and utilize a good tool, that's an accelerator. You're going to get more goodness. If you're doing a bunch of silly stuff and you don't know how to use the tools that you have, you're not following best practice, well, then it's just going to help you go the wrong direction faster because it's just going to augment you. It's just more you. It's really exactly. kind of like a digital twin. You know. That's what scares so, me so much, Pete. Well, <laughs> it, it can be scary. It really can be. But, you know, the, the thing about it is you see this in Canada. We just saw this in the last few months with Air Canada, right? Is that Air Canada turned over their customer service to a chatbot. Chatbot promised a refund to a customer that was against Air Canada's policy. It went to the courts and the court was like, it's your chatbot. So whatever it promised, you're on the hook for it. Artificial stupidity. Um, the, you know, and, and there's lots of other examples. If you wanted to go down a dark rabbit hole in the news, you can just go check it out. Just go watch the news and you can see all sorts of stuff about AI killing people all over the world. But um, how can it help you? 
I don't know, Greg. You know, I look at this. I, I like. I think ChatGP is an interesting editor um, for yep. um, you know, people that are writing. I've tried uh, it for different types of lighting codes and stuff like that. It's not very good at that, at least in my experience of that. And maybe I'll hook up with Pete after and see if maybe he can help me with that. Um, but, you know, folks, uh, we're coming to the end of the show here. I want to invite you to go to ETISSL.com. Forget about AI for a minute. Let's talk about lighting, Greg Eric. No AI. The computer's not going to tell you what to do here. You got to do it. You got to go to ETI. ETISSL.com. That's our night lighter product. We talked about that nice 2000 Kelvin Ooh. glow cans, uh, surface mount fixture, you know, square cans even, one by four fixture. Like I'm saying, I'm still thinking that kitchen thing through. I got to do that. I got to call somebody after that. The scope of what they have down there at ETISSL.com, man, you got to check it out. This is a company. They're legit. They're real. They're there, and they got a lot of stuff. If you nail distributors out there, you got light bulbs in a warehouse. You need some ETISSL in that warehouse, sucker. And of course, National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. You got light bulbs in a warehouse. I've been saying it over and over. I'm Michael Colligan. That's Greg Harris. You got light <laughs> Greg Eric, you got light bulbs in a warehouse. Do we have it all covered? You can join Nailed. If you don't have light bulbs in a warehouse, you've got to be an associate member. Not an actual member, associate member. But you can still join. But there's no ROI. You gotta serve the industry down here. We're taking over, we're setting it straight, we're making everything better. Go to NAILD.org and we thank Pete Gret of the BlackRock. Dot group his linkedin will be on the uh, his automated ai linkedin which got him on the get a grip on lighting podcast somehow <laughs> will be on the get a grip on lighting.com website check it out of course like subscribe but most importantly thank you for listening and watching this episode bye for now <laughs>